Welcome to the Hail to the King podcast. I'm Magnus. And I'm Mark. And in this episode, we're going to talk about Ur, which was a short story that Stephen King uh, published as a Kindle, Amazon Kindle exclusive. And it was exclusive for about a year, and then it became an audiobook. And then several years later, in 2015, it was uh, included on the collection The Bazaar of Bad Dreams in 2015. Um, but yeah, whatever method you uh, check the book out, doesn't matter. But uh, whether Kindle, audio, or paper. But um, we're not snooty about it. No. Like the, uh, like the, the main, main character. character. Which... Uh, yeah, here's a here's a quick uh, a quick synopsis of the story. This one is about a English professor at a small college, uh, a good college but not a great college, um, who gets in a, a huge fight with his girlfriend, who's a coach for the the girls' basketball team, and uh, breaks up with her. And I guess the the fight they got in w- involved. Uh, he he okay this this guy he has a love of books and a love is kind of a uh, too short of a description he's got an obsession with you know printed books the smell of books he's he's uh, romanticized everything about the old ways of doing things the old physical copies the smell the yeah, he, the does, feel, he does mention that you know? like books have a smell they have a feel they have weight you, they're physical objects you can you can tell that his uh again he he says his mistress is you know the books you know yeah <laughs> so he, the his girlfriend is talking about something he's reading a book not really paying attention and she gets so mad at him that she picks up the book says uh you know why don't you read it read it on the computer like, like the, the rest, rest of us, us. you know yeah. she's resenting his love of books and throws the book across the room and they get in a you know he calls her I, I don't remember what he calls her at that point but um says some insult and they get broken up anyways out of spite he orders an amazon kindle so that he can kind of like a george costanza move set up like a, a little <laughs> zinger that he's got cooked up that's where... actually perfect. Now, now that's all I can think of him as is George, George Costanza. Costanza. He's he's a very Costanza like character. He is, but uh, he's very petty. Um, he he wants to get this Kindle so that he can place himself in a you know the teacher's lounge reading a book on his Kindle. And when when his ex girlfriend comes up and asks about it, he can, oh, I'm just reading a book on the computer like the rest of you. And you know. like that's his that's his zinger. It's the uh, <laughs> he says like oh so spiteful. Oh, like he, the, he'll feel so awesome when he says is that. Is it the shrimp store? Oh, the jerk store called. They're running out of you. <laughs> that's kind of yeah. Again, very very Costanza. Oh so gosh. anyways, he orders this Kindle, and when it shows up, uh, second day air, which he didn't order. He ordered a you know ground transportation that would have taken a week, but it comes the next day, and it's a pink Kindle. He doesn't really know anything about it, but at this point, Kindles only came out in white. And uh, the pink, to uh, longtime Stephen King fans, uh, we know that pink sometimes is an indicator of evil, you know, or something ominous, you know, like uh, it, specifically to Dark Tower, you've got the, the pink grapefruit, the Mer- Maryland's grapefruit. Mm-hmm. You know, the bend of the rainbow, the, the pink bend of the rainbow. Yeah, which is pretty much a magic ball that uh, if, you know, you can look into it and see, you know, what it wants to show you, but it's going to show you things that are going to be upsetting, you know, like whether it's a few, something that happens in the future, like a loved one getting hurt, whether it's, you know, it's just, it's kind of that monkey's paw of seeing you know, a seeing eyeglass. Anyways, we've got uh, the the Bill Hodges trilogy. Um, yeah. The uh, I think the last book that came out, uh, End of Watch. There's a little pink fish, goldfish. the the pink goldfish on there that's kind of symbolizing kind of shows you the, that something's up with yeah, this one. The I think the 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 goldfish is meant to represent uh, what's his name, uh, the the 
antagonist in that trilogy. Um, I can't remember his name, but he's kind of this serial killer. And uh, what's what's another one of the pink ones? Oh, another one is well in the actual book. So the fourth book of the Dark Tower. Mm -hmm. There's there's that. Honestly, I can't think of. Oh, any you know other what? Right uh, now. What um, what's the book? The big one about the artist. The oh, Duma, Duma key. key. The the house is big pink. Big pink. Big pink, and which is kind of a haunted, haunted house that uh, is on a beach. That that's a really cool book. I'm excited to get to that one. That's one of our favorites. <laughs> so good. No, but after he he gets the gets that Kindle. That Kindle, and uh, it has some interesting menu options, like uh, kind of it gives him the option to pick his uh the er to search for a book in and it gives uh, i i can't i don't remember how many millions of possible errs for uh well it says like experimental function yeah or experimental like function so you can go in and i think there was there was a letter authors like there was like a letter that came with it in the mail that said this is like an experimental model right something something like that and you know we hope you have a good experience but he has the option to pick a number between you know one and several you know however many millions of uh, possibilities and once you pick that then it's like pick an author and he ends up going with uh ernest ernest, ernest hemingway, hemingway which i guess is one of his uh, one of his favorites and he notices on the list of uh, available books to download that there's the some of the dates are wrong for some of the books and there's titles that didn't exist he he thought that he had read everything he had which that moment kind of reminded me of stephen king you know like i i've read almost everything by him uh aside from the latest two books the outsider and uh sleeping, sleeping beauties. beauties i read part of sleeping beauties but then i decided to hold off and save it for this book club but um yeah, I was able to relate to the character with that. You know, the whole, I've read everything by this guy. You yep. know, it's like, what is this on the list? If I all of a sudden saw a Stephen King book list that included a bunch of other things, it's like, got to, gets you suspicious. So he uh, he checks out this book. He starts reading like a like a sample out of it, or, or he just downloads it. I can't remember. No, he, he and, downloads it, and it's... Because he's like, oh, this at least sounds like yeah, it the Hemingway mm -hmm. title, and it's Cortland's Dogs. And I, I like that he mentions the that there's some computer that uh, analyzes like text and can tell you like who the author, you know, it analyzes their writing style, their sentence structure, that kind of thing, and it can you can plug in anything and it'll tell you like who wrote it, pretty much. Yeah, it's almost like a, uh, an author's writing style and everything the way that they form their sentences i mean that does have it's like a fingerprint you can figure out yeah. you know who's who just by their style kind of reminds me of like in art you know it's like you can look at a, a picasso and pretty much know it's a picasso yeah you can look at a, a vincent van gogh and know that he did it you know it's like certain signatures so, that you really can't fake yeah and so that that's pretty neat he just kind of mentions that briefly but that's some, one of those things that kind of stuck with me is the idea of taking a book that might have existed in another world you plug it into this computer and it's like yep this is genuine hemingway you yep. know um but yeah so he he starts reading this book and it's just blowing him away it's like one of the best books he's ever read um, you know, he's like, this has got to be Hemingway. So then he, uh, takes, so, yeah. Yeah. So he, he, he's freaking out and he's like, oh my gosh, this can't be real. You know, he's going through that doubting stage and he brings in two people. He brings in a, just fellow professor and a student. And the student who actually told him about the Kindle. Yeah. The student that's like he, uh, he, Robbie Henderson. Yeah. He has a funny story where he's in class and he's going to reprimand this student, uh, for, you know, having a, a video game or, a you know, I guess it nowadays a PDA, like a device. Smart, yeah, PD, <laughs> a PDA, a smartphone, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, he's like, no, this is the assignment. The book is on this Kindle, you know? And yeah. Oh, well he actually tells a student, he's like, this isn't an internet chat room. Yeah. This, this isn't is a, an internet this chat is a room. Literature class, you know, kind of, <laughs> Man, he, he, he sounds wants, like such a dork. He wants to be perceived as old school. Yeah. But then, uh, 
uh, at the end of his conversation with this kid about the Kindle, you know, he kind of says, maybe I'll check it out because his mind is already in the works to get revenge on his girlfriend. With Which his this is comment. his revenge. So it gives you an <laughs> idea of the type of person he is. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's really funny. Um, but yeah, so he, he wants to be perceived as old school, but teachable. You know, not well, stuck in. He your wants ways. to be perceived by as old school by his students. Oh yeah, yeah. and new school by his colleagues. By his which, colleagues. Oh, George Costanza all the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he so he brings these two people in. He brings um, Don Allman uh, from the English department. He plays a and, real mean tuba. Oh, I'm Don Allman, one of the Allman brothers. One of the Allman brothers. I play a mean tuba. It's like a pretty. <laughs> but bad, he doesn't like, actually play tuba. <laughs> pretty bad uncle joke. <laughs> yeah. You know. And so he brings them in and they, he's like, if you guys can actually see this, then maybe I'm not insane. But if you can't see this, if you don't see anything, then I will gladly check into, you know, whatever. Like a, an asylum. Like mental, <laughs> mental asylum. Yeah, is, he, he's is not sure if he's going crazy with this Kindle or, you know, if it, it's legit. So he brings in a scholarly source and a student, yeah. you know, to check it out. And so they start checking it out. You know, they check out. Uh, Don Allman, he specializes in um, Shakespeare Shakespeare, and uh, that kind of era of writers. Because you mentioned Edgar Allan Poe as well. Something yeah. like that. And then, you know, the student, he his favorite is, um, I can't remember who it was, but they, they check out all these different authors and they're just... They're like, wow, this is like, you know, j- this it's creepy feels them. legit. It's you creepy, know? but they're having a good time with it until... <laughs> They get to a they, point where they look they, up. There's a there's another er function that uh, lets you check out news archives from all the different uh, different ers, and they start looking at New York, uh, the New York Times, throughout these different dimensions, you know, and uh, like what what's the date? Do you remember? I don't know, but they it's, look up the Kennedy assassination, yeah. and that's what um, Robbie Henderson, the student, he's like, you know. Yeah, I'm learning that the Kennedy assassination was kind of a seminal moment in mm-hmm. U.S. history. So they look up to see if that is true throughout all these er worlds. Mm-hmm. And it's some, 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 some worlds of them, it they is, don't. some it mm-hmm. isn't. And then, you know, eventually it all stops when they find an er. It's like er one million something. And the Kennedy assassination didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're... It seems like there was something that happened because the ER function doesn't show anything past that particular oh, date. Oh, and that it's, was uh, 1962, and it was November, the Cuban Missile Crisis. The, yeah. His student plugs in just as a, I'll plug my birthday in, you know, birthday number in for the ER selection, uh, and that gives him the the no no published uh, no, no issues no past this day. Passed. Yeah. And so they, they look at that, and then that kind of, you know, stops the party. Everyone out of the pool. This they, isn't fun anymore. It's like, a, you know, Manhattan is decimated by a nuclear attack. You know, Russia is gone. You know, basically the world is in turmoil, and they're reading, you know, all these issues of the the New, York's time, New York Times before an end of a world scenario yeah. where the Cuban Missile Crisis ended badly for the world. So um, one thing real quick. This story feels a little bit like a companion story to 112263. That's exactly what I had down yeah. in my notes. It, it's it's really cool cuz yeah, it's not the exact type of scenario, but it kind of it's almost like a it's like a prequel. Feels like a little kind bit, of a yeah. little teaser like hey, what if, you it's know, a, something about changing the future, you know, what if if 112263 is about a guy, an English teacher who <laughs> figures out a stumbles across a portal that sends him back to 1960 to you know for whatever reason and he throughout that book he eventually decides that he's going to stop the Kennedy assassination so we'll we'll do that we'll cover that book later but it's a kind of a nice what if if it only he had had a kindle he wouldn't have to you yeah. know go through and be the one to save the president you know <laughs> and that would actually be a really good for for any listeners who want a good pairing um check read this one her out. and then right after read eleven twenty two sixty three. yeah and that'll, there's a there's a really good 
a TV adaptation on Hulu starring James Franco, which initially sounds a little bit off. You're like, James Franco? English teacher? Stephen King's story? Eh, I don't know. But it is excellent. Um, one of one of the better adaptations. I think it's like an 8 or 10 episode miniseries. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I probably hold it up there in the top 5 TV show adaptations of a Stephen King book or story. So, anyways... Back to Ur. <laughs> so they're go they're going after this, uh, just so we don't, you know, go too too far into it. But after the they figure out, you know, world ends, in one Ur at you know 1962, they go like they part ways, and Wes, the English professor who originally got the Kindle, he is looking at things and he finds out that there's an Ur function for the future in current events. So he looks up his hometown to see if his girlfriend's basketball team is going to win or not. Cause if he'd like to give her a present when she comes back, like, Oh, Hey, here's a nice little, you guys won present. Good job. Or here's a, you know, yeah, and, and present he, for if you guys lost. And he discovered this feature after everyone kind of all went home and, uh, you know, after they did a marathon reading of all these different dimensions, uh, you know, favorite authors uh he's kind of sitting i think it's in a coffee shop or something yeah and he uh discovers that uh local future archive i think or something and, that, like and that. there's a little warning like you know all paradox oh, laws paradox laws apply, apply to you know future or functions or whatever it was and so he reads it and finds out that the bus that his girlfriend on is on and her name's uh ellen for a basketball championship carrying the team to like a neighboring school like it's not a, it's not a happy article they actually crash his girlfriend dies and a lot of the students die in that in that bus crash because of a drunk driver and so he takes it to you know he's freaking out he takes it to the student robbie because his other the other professor isn't available he takes it to robbie they kind of concoct a plan he tries calling Calling his they girlfriend. try to stop the bus, see what they can do to stop. You know, it's like, are they going to believe us? You know, we have this Kindle that tells the future. You can't, you know, ride on the bus. Yeah. And, <laughs> well, and so she, well. she, she shuts him down. She's like, look, we broke up. I talked to you. We're totally going to talk about the breakup because she still has feelings for him. But ironically, she uh, she start, she gives him a phone call real, real quick. She gives him a phone call before all this saying, hey, I want to. I want to give you a second chance. I saw you with the Kindle, and I I took that oh, as that's a. Funny. I forgot about it's that. It's like I took that as a, as a what, sign. Like a, a sign that maybe <laughs> you're not a hopeless whatever. So it you're kind of a lost case backfired in his favor. So his and made him feel really guilty for his little petty, uh, his little petty thing he wanted to do. So that worked out for him, but uh, she said that she doesn't want him to call or do anything until after this championship game so now he's trying to call his girlfriend and she's like i can't talk to you now she keeps shutting him down shutting him down he's like wait nope let me tell you nope i can't talk to you boom you know hangs up i really don't want to screw this up boom so the the student robbie has a girlfriend on the team and he's like yeah she's not gonna believe me there there's nothing we can do there so they ultimately decide instead of trying to stop the bus that they find out uh, it was a drunk driver who crashes into the bus. Candy is her name. Yep, Candy Reimer, I think. Yep. And uh, so they they find out where she's gonna be, and she's at like a roadhouse uh, bar, and uh, so they decide to find out where she is at and meet her out in the parking lot. And uh, Wes actually ends up kind of mm-hmm. losing his head a little bit because. He, he doesn't even give her a chance. He like goes up and, like, shakes her, it, it, getting that, really pissed at her, slapping her around, like, hey, clean up your life. Stop being a drunk. Kind of kind of reminded me of uh, Minority Report a little bit. You know, you know the future, and you're going out to try to stop it. But in Minority... Did you ever see Minority mm-hmm. Report? Um, yeah. The whole idea of somebody getting arrested or punished for something that they hadn't even done yet. I mean, yeah, she's drunk in the car, but still, they approach her and... 
yeah, he kind of loses his uh, loses his shit a little bit and pun you know punches her out and and he's smacking her at, smacking like, her. He you is know. not nice. Yeah, it's like you did this and you know and we know kinda, that she's kind of crying. She's like, why is everyone so mean to me? Yeah, um, so, a little sympathetic, but at the same time, yeah. No, so they they end up doing that and they end up saving saving the bus. Mm-hmm. So the bus comes back, everything's happy, and you're almost like, oh, happy ending and. And then the low men show up, and yeah. they've shown up in other books. So uh, it's Heart uh, of Atlantis, Heart, Talisman. Hearts in Atlantis, the Talisman. There's a book called uh, From a Buick Eight, mm-hmm. which I don't think you've read that one. Right? I haven't read yeah. that one. From a Buick Eight is like all about the weird cars, the flashy cars, and the guys in trench coats, and you know these cars possibly being otherworldly. And, and it obviously they obviously show up in the dark tower. I like that the the car is even the flashy red, which by the way, have you ever read Christine? Nope. Christine's another great one. Again, it's about a we'll, flashy we'll red it. car. Yep. Anyways, um, seeing the low men show up is pretty neat. It's a little bit confusing. I was actually gonna bring this up because the low men seem to be on the side of people yes. who are trying to take down the tower. And, but this guy who shows up at there's two two low two, men. two low men who who are at his apartment to confront him about his uh, essentially breaking the paradox laws. Um, it's like why why do they seem concerned with yeah they, they 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 tell him you know your actions are making the tower tremble and they and they seem concerned for the tower and the rose and the rose but so, that is incongruous with the fact that they actually have i don't know if it's a pin it's, it's a the the eye the red yeah eye. they have the red eye of the crimson king and so and again maybe it was more about timing you know they're they're upset at the interference by some you know outside party that m- could foul up the the plans that they have for bringing down the tower it's it's a little confusing but Anyways, we'll if, go, we'll if go any that if anybody has any insights on that, you know, leave them in the comments. We we, we invite you guys to leave comments, comments or shoot us shoot us an email at you know our hail to the king podcast at gmail dot com. You know, we'll we'll have that stuff posted later. But um, yeah, in the meantime, our comment section on these videos is probably the best way to give us your theories. But that's one that really really confuses me is their concern for the tower and i'm like aren't these the guys who are taking trying to take down the tower anyways no so they they show up they they get pretty pissed at wesley and essentially they give him a slap on the wrist they're like we don't know the implications of what you've done but and since we don't know we're gonna let you off because he they say you know you you've ruined things it's the damage is already done the damage is already done and and then Wesley kind of shoots back like, hey, you guys say that everything serves the tower. I'm part of the universe. Like, isn't what I did serving the tower his, too? His silver tongue that, talks him out of uh, potentially, who knows what they were going to do. Take him away. Kill him. Kill him. You know, who knows. But and So that ends up saving his, him. Yeah, his argument that if everything serves the rose and serves the tower, that he's part of that. Even if it what seems like. It's not. Yeah. So. So he ends up, you know, getting off fine. He doesn't get killed, doesn't get taken to, you know, and the you paradox a, jail. And you get a nice little happy ending. He yeah. gets, it seems to get back together with, his girlfriend, with his girlfriend. Reconciles with his girlfriend. Everything's cool. It's a, it's a nice little contained two hour. You know, probably takes about two, two and a half hours for someone to it's read. It's two hours twenty minutes, I think. Yeah, the audiobook is two hours twenty minutes, but um. Yeah, it's a, it's a great one. It's it's one of my like you want to you want a taste of just like what Stephen King's, you know, it gives you that shared universe feel, mentions a lot about the tower, that kind of stuff, so it kind of if you have haven't read those kind of gets you want more uh, you know, it's got it's got the all the ingredients in a nice little little hors d'oeuvre, yep. you know. Like I said, that's why it's a perfect one to read right before you read Eleven twenty two sixty three, and then you mm-hmm. know that would be a perfect jumping off point to other other books, other works. So yeah, this this is a good one, good one to start on if uh, you guys are looking for that opportunity. I think you can still get it in the Kindle store. You can get it from Audible. Get this little you know audio book. Um, 
you know, if you guys, if any of you guys know me, I, you know, I've got the book, you know, it's, it's, there's so many different ways you can get it from the library, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. Pink. Pink. Let's go back to pink. Let's, let's go back to pink. I, cause I was trying to think, okay, is it just a, a symbol or in my head, I was like, is, is the bend of the rainbow, the pink bend of the rainbow, the grapefruit mm -hmm. out there somewhere. And somehow they've managed to harness it. Yeah. And then send it out to these little Kindles. Yep. Possibly, you know, it's, it's the, the mainframe, you yeah. know? So again, and that, that kind of goes with my conclusion as the, or not conclusion, but my theory on, uh, the, the grapefruit being something that it can show you, but is it going to be bad news, you know? And then it's like, did that, was the bus crash going to happen before he read it? Or is it something that, you know, you kind of invite in that evil to mess with it, you know? And yeah. Pet Cemetery has a very similar, uh, you know, nothing pink, but that similar idea of did the accident happen to the little boy getting run over because he knew about the pet cemetery, you know, like there were evil forces acting on, you know, that whole situation. It's like, did it happen because of that? Or would his family have been fine if he just was never introduced to the pet cemetery? Yeah. It's yeah. But, uh, the pink. So what I, what I was thinking one, they could have harnessed, you know, cause you don't know, in the in the dark tower you don't actually know what happens to that bend of the rainbow the grapefruit so it is a possibility that they somehow found found it harnessed it i don't i don't think it's just a symbol of bad things to come i or you know just what could happen because of a couple things in the book in ur he starts to get enchant or get like sucked into the Kindle, not to the extent <laughs> that, you know, in the fourth book of the Dark Tower, there's a character named Rhea, Rhea of the Coos, and she gets sucked into the pink glass, the pink you become the rainbow. You become obsessed with it, kind of a golem, you know, my precious. You don't want anyone else to, to you know, have it. It's your thing. It has its own, and I think in the Dark Tower, that book, they refer to it as the glam. The glam. And the pink bend of the rainbow has its own glam. It's like putting you under a spell, almost uh, hypnotizing you. And it seems like that's what's happening with the Kindle. Because he, he keeps going back to it. It's, if they didn't rip it out of his hands, he would have kept going back to it regardless and you know of what? the consequences. And maybe because he's such a like uh, despicable, you know, cynical guy. <laughs> maybe because it's like he's, maybe, maybe he's he, George. He, again, and he knows it. He knows that he's a you know kind of he's a scumbag selfish. yeah and so one of the things he says is uh when he invites the his student and his colleague over to look at this kindle he's he's like man i'm glad it was easy to just hand over to them because i don't need to feel addicted to it you know like he had that kind of pre uh idea that he could become addicted to this kindle if he didn't let other people touch it he didn't want it to the the kind of turn into a little golem you know yeah so kind of neat you know maybe just certain type of people can uh avoid um that kind of addiction you know yeah and that's why i think like it's not just the color and and this is also why i think of it in what is it the third book of the bill hodges uh, mm -hmm. trilogy and a watch and a watch the little pink thing has the same you know you have this little uh, game. What is it? It's a Nintendo Switch. It's something. It's a little game device. Yeah, just like a little Almost portable like a, game. Like, yeah, a little Game Boy. And you're supposed to, like, the antagonist enchants people by having them look for this pink... A puzzle, right? Yeah. Kind of know, a little puzzle game. It's a puzzle with fish. They look <laughs> for the pink fish. And so... And they become enchanted with it. And it, in that book, it happens much quicker than than in this one than in Ur, but i still think that it's more than just something it's it's enchanting it's glamming the person who's viewing it and so that's why i think there's a stronger connection to pink bend of the rainbow like i said yeah. maybe no it's, it's maybe they you know it's like they have amazon has its little satellite <laughs> in the Ur world that goes to all other worlds 
you know, maybe at the Dark Tower, there's a nice little pink ball at the top, and that just shines out to everything else. Yeah. And that's just, that's more funny, but there's some connection there that's stronger than mere coincidence, I think. Do uh, do you have any favorite quotes out of this one? Like, I, I, I know I heard, like, when I was listening to it, I heard a few that were pretty good. But again, they were kind of just, like, little quips. No. Nothing, nothing really, like, uh, you know, worth anything really lasting nothing that really impressed on me besides just the story itself not so. quotes more i was just thinking of the ideas like twinners mm-hmm. so for those of you just listening the idea of twinners it's you know the it's the concept that there are other realities out there parallel to ours other parallel universes and you know there is a version of you in each of these and this is very prominent in the talisman as well as the dark tower series in that there are certain some people that are that have twinners they have you know their parallel version of themselves in these these different universes and then some people who are single natured who don't have who don't have a parallel in any universe and it kind of kind of hits on that um that uh you know some universes he is able to find you know 17,000 books by Hemingway, but he couldn't find, you know, oh, s- several books by Faulkner in some of these universes. And this, and this guy, he's an aspiring uh, author. He's, you know, I've got that, that novel in me that I'm going to write someday. Quote, yeah. quote, aspiring bunny ears. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, he, he, uh, he, bl- he, you know, seems to blame everyone else besides himself as to why he's not getting it done. But uh, he looks up his own name in all these different worlds to see if there's any worlds where he is a successful author. And there's none. And it's, a li- it's a little I'm bit a sad. <laughs> He's a loser in all worlds. In all worlds. <laughs> there's no version of him that succeeds. But, yeah. So that was, you know. That was a fun one. A fun little little thing. <laughs> but um, Low men. The low men. Or did you have? Um... Not really. I just liked them showing up. Like it was cool, cool to see them. I'm, I'm glad we got to see a little bit of what the low men are like in the Dark Tower movie. You know, wearing the people skin, the yeah. people masks, and you know, like I think he describes uh, when they talk, it's like talking through like a throat full of moths. Yeah, and it's just like that sounds gross. Like someone's throat full of, like a mouthful of just bugs. <laughs> you know. Speaking of the Dark Tower, there's a lot of things that really broke me about that movie as a Stephen King fan. Mm-hmm. But as far as portraying some things like the low men, yeah, they did cool. a good job there. Mm-hmm. Like the visual, it, it made you, it creeped me out. Yeah. I wish that they would have shown like the, like the, the, the more flashy low men in a flashy car with the trench coats and stuff. You see it a little bit in the adaptation of uh hearts in Atlantis, which is terrible by the way, but um, it's are got mean, Anthony, Anthony mean- Hopkins. You meaning the book's terrible or the no, movie? No, no, no. The movie's terrible. It's because just awful. I did not like the book. The story. I did not like the book. Yeah. Um, the, anyways, the story. Uh, um, Hearts in Atlantis is like three stories, like three novellas, I guess. One of them I really like. I like all the, the stuff. The first one. All the stuff dealing with the low men and w- what's the guy's name? Brodigan. Yep. Uh, Brodigan is a character who. He That's the An- Anthony Hopkins character in the movie, but he's kind of this psychic who helps this little boy in his life and gets taken away by the low men at the end of the movie. And in the movie, it's almost like they're more like government agents. So, but they kind of have that cool, you know, the uh, Stetson or fedoras and the trench coats and stuff. So I'm like, ah, oh, that's cool. But um, yeah, Brodigan shows up in I think it's book six. Maybe yeah, six of he the shows Dark up Tower. In six. Yeah, and he's just an uh, important psychic who's uh, in that book. Anyways, <laughs> so do you think without too, not too many spoilers? I was wondering, and if any listener has any theory on this, because they show up. Maybe it is that the Lomans show up in Ur, mm-hmm. and it seems like they're doing something good. They are trying to make it so you know the world doesn't break by destroying you know, by breaking these paradox laws, but they also serve, or we, 
you know, we I, I assume they serve the Crimson King because they have have that. And so I, I was wondering, you know, if there's anyone who has any theories on that, that would be interesting to go so, over. So you you've seen Infinity War, mm-hmm. right? Uh, th- this I'm I'm gonna do kind of a small spoiler for Infinity War. Uh, the Red Skull shows up, and he's kind of this. He's on uh, like I don't remember the name of the planet, but he's protecting the Soul Stone. He's kind of a, a uh, what would you say? Um, he's a... a keeper of this. You know, like, yeah. He he guards this entrance and this whole shrine and tell you know he's kind of the guide, the, like a spirit guide kind of thing. But um, with the Low Men, I kind of was thinking this is published way after Stephen King was done with the Dark Tower. And maybe at this point, the low men are now have gone from enemies of the rose, enemies of the tower, to because the the you know the events of the dark tower are you know the, those books are gone. He's it's like five years after that he wrote this story, and maybe they're now you know in a a, a position where they are for, you know forced into servitude to guard the tower you know maybe they serve the white at this point yeah i was also thinking maybe because they kind of seem like they don't really care they're kind of begrudgingly you know eh, we you know we're we're here to you know take care of this problem but they let him off with a little slap on the wrist they don't really you know seem too gung-ho about punishing this guy for breaking the paradox laws and making the tower tremble seems like to me it seems like they did care a little bit more i don't know yeah or or i don't know that's again that's just kind of a rough theory i don't really know it's it's just up in the air but but... yeah that's that's the one thing that really just kind of confuses me about the story but i think if anyone has any ideas let us know it is after the (laughs) it is after those events and that's something i've always wondered is the events of the dark tower you know ended but they didn't really end and so you know as roland goes on his journey time and time again he keeps going back you know to 1999 keeps going back over and over and so does that happen where it's like a wheel and you know it's like a tire going along roland's here he comes back to the same place because the tire's round but then the road that he's going on is this timeline that is just straight for, for, I don't know. For any of you who haven't read The Dark Tower, that's all going to sound extremely confusing. So don't don't worry yeah, about sorry it. sorry about that. <laughs> D- don't, don't worry about it. But Stephen King does some really interesting stuff with uh, cycles, shared universes, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, maybe so, we'll, we'll go We'll, we'll, go we'll, get, we'll dive into that, that a little more later. But anyone who has, <laughs> like we said before, anyone who has theories, who wants to chime in, that's something that's pretty interesting is The Low Men... Who who are they? Who do they have allegiance to? Who do to they at this serve? Point? Which master do they serve? Do they serve the Crimson King and you know that, or do they serve the White at this point? Is it a begrudging servitude, mm-hmm. or is it you know more that they they do it because of belief? Who knows? Mm-hmm. But chime in with that. That's an interesting one. So, yeah. Um. I mean, that's pretty much the story. I think. I th- is there anything else you want to add? No, I think I think that's it. So. We, we have a few uh, uh, just kind of updates. We're working on a timeline for you guys just to let you guys know what we're kind of planning on reading in the future. It's not concrete yet, uh, but uh, we're uh, next episode. Next episode is going to be it. We're going to do it. And we're going to do that in a two-part. So the first part, uh, and this is this could change. Yeah, we'll we might keep change you it up updated. a little bit. But we might do kind of what the movie's doing where we cover, you know, either the childhood stuff and we just have an episode where we're talking about when they were kids and then the next episode we talk about more the adult stuff. And then the conclusion. And the conclusion, that. yeah. And we so pretty much we might just do what the movie did. <laughs> you know. And, and that, is and, and is going fine. to do. But we wanna we figured that it is a uh, one that uh, is w- definitely worth worth the time. It is a large book, and we want to give you guys some time to to do it. So um, we'll also probably make an announcement on uh, you know an early episode earlier episode because this is episode five. 
that we're recording right now, mm -hmm. and we're actually we've actually gone a few episodes ahead. We have a couple in the bank, and uh, we'll probably tag something on there to remind you guys that we're starting it. So if anyone wants to pick that up for the first time, there's an old uh, eight nineteen eighty nine mini series that all, we all grew up with, with Tim Curry, Tim, the Tim Curry yeah. version, which is it's still good, but. Uh, it's it's worth your time even if you're just getting kind of the the cliff notes version of the story uh the new movie um so far you know one of two movies is out at this point just the childhood part and i really like it a lot it it changes a little bit of details about the story it sets it in the 80s versus set in the 50s yeah um for the kids uh, era but I'm really excited for the sequel, and we wanted to get these episodes out, and we'll probably do another one, maybe, you know, talk about the, the newer movie once it comes out. But, uh, yeah. Seems like the idea, if I remember. We wanted to set it so that this one, this one will be released, the It will be released, it's part two, on... Halloween. Halloween. And so. so stay tuned for that. It would be it's gonna be a fun one. Month of scary clowns. Yeah. That'll be a fun one. Uh a couple updates. We are if if we haven't done it by this point, uh check us out on, you know, we're trying to get Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so you can connect with us and we can connect with you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be Hail to the King podcast on pretty much all all social all media social media platforms. So you Instagram, uh, Facebook. Our, the, initially, we're just releasing these on YouTube. Eventually, we'll we'll get uh, a, a we'll, to iTunes. And... We'll we'll figure out the the real podcast stuff. You know, iTunes, <laughs> Spotify, blah 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 blah. So. Anyways, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. That that wraps it up for us today. If you're wanting more content, like we said, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And remember, there are other worlds than these. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!